Hi everyone, my name is Jamie Farrell and I am a sophomore in the college majoring in environmental biology. Hi, I'm Carter, I'm also a sophomore in the college and I'm majoring in philosophy. And the third member of our team is Lola Bushnell. She is a junior in the college majoring in government and minoring in environmental studies. But she couldn't be here with us today because she's sailing um, competitively. Uh, and we just wanted to say thank you so much to Daniela and everyone else who made this awesome event possible. We're so excited to be here um, today and share a little bit of, with you about our project, um, which deals with uh, microfiber pollution. Right, so every time a fleece is washed, it releases to around 250,000 microfibers. And that's a big number, but why is that bad? Well, microfibers are tiny, tiny pieces of plastic that are released whenever any sort of synthetic garment is washed. And they are often way too small to be... They're, oh, sorry. They're often way too small to be uh, captured and picked up by wastewater treatment plants or the in washing machine filters. So about 40% of these will make it to uh, aquatic environments. And it's all, all types of garments release them, but acrylic are the worst, and they release about 750,000 per wash, which is an incredible statistic. And in these environments, in these marine environments, they can be uh, hugely problematic. So they're really, really harmful, especially to juvenile fish species. And beyond that, they're excellent harborers of persistent organic pollutants, and that's speculated. Thanks to the high surface area to volume ratio, it can lead to real bioaccumulation up the food chain of these uh, pollutants, which is possibly even to us, but that's still. So the craziest thing, the craziest thing about this maybe is the fact that it's, it's a really newly discovered problem, um, which is astonishing given its scale. One study estimated that up to 85% of the pollution around shorelines in the world is microfibers. And another organization called um, Adventure Scientists, which we've worked with a little bit, um, has collected samples from all over the world. And what they've found is that in marine ecosystems, per liter of water in their samples, there were around 12 micro, um, microplastics, which is pretty crazy. Um, so how did we get involved in this topic? So we took a class last semester entitled Science and Society Global Challenges. But since then, this, this has morphed into so much more than just a, a simple class project for us. It's, it's really become a passion of ours. Um, and we've been able to look at this, at this problem from, from multiple points of impact, really. So uh, the first point of impact and the first thing we looked at was to assess the scale of the problem in a local area. So we did some water testing. With the help of SIPS, we partnered with the Adventure Scientists Organization to do some water testing on the Potomac. And the results were a little encouraging. There's about one microfiber per liter. And that's a little bit lower than the uh, freshwater average. And we tested upstream and downstream from the Blue Plains wastewater treatment plant. And the results indicated that it was actually doing maybe a pretty good job at filtering these out. And it gave us a new way with which to, I guess, attack the huge problem which we're, our oceans are facing. And that was to uh, advocate for improved wastewater treatment facilities and possible washing machine filters so they can, because uh, obviously it's a huge impact that this could have on stopping these getting out into the water. However, there are still microfibers, which brings us to our second point of impact, which we've become quite invested in over the past couple of months. So what we've designed um, with the help of our SIPS grant and, and many generous interns, or not interns, that would be nice, but we're, we're not quite there yet. Uh, many generous mentors is an in-wash filter bag into which you place your synthetic clothing so that it captures the microfibers and stops them from getting out into the waterways where they can affect so much harm um, on the environments there. Now our testing methods are pretty simple but I would be lying if I said that we were not chased out of a few laundry rooms um, along the way before we got our own washing machine to to use. Um, essentially we put synthetic garments in the wash um, with our bag uh, and without our bag and then we filter that water out um, through, a, through a system that we've constructed and we weigh the amount of fibers that, are, that come out on the filters uh, when there was the bag present and when there was not the bag present. By now, we have about an 85% capture rate, um, which, which we think is pretty good, but we're definitely um, eager to you know, ramp that up and, and get into the 90s, because uh, we think that would you know, be quite impactful for the environment. Now, like we said, though, the solution space is wide open because it's such a new, um, newly discovered problem. 
And we recognize that this solution is not the only one, and, and moreover, it, sh it should not be the only one. However, we do think that ours is particularly impactful for the way in which it brings the solving power to the customer. All it really takes is a zip of the bag and a toss in the wash or the dryer, and the consumer really, really, really does become a part of the solution. So our next steps going forward are to hopefully partner with an outdoor wear, a synthetic outdoor wear manufacturer, and that we think can not only bring our product to an audience, but also help motivate the issue at hand because it's such a huge problem and this can't be the only solution for it to be successful in eradicating it. And we also have the incredible opportunity this summer when we will be working on this full time to work with the photographer Ben Von Wong and we're gonna be producing a series of photographs and a video just to detail the scope of the problem and hopefully that will really motivate the issue to a new audience. And what we really want to do is change the culture of owning synthetic clothing. So when you would always take a suit say to go get dry clean. We want people to think the same way about fleeces and synthetic garments and using a product like ours to stop uh, those microfibers from getting out. So thank you so much for hearing us speak today. It's, it's been a pleasure. This event is great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Sarah Belford and I'm with McCourt e and &E. I'm pleased today to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Paul Bungie is a global thought leader in bringing innovation to solve environmental grand challenges. Dr. Bungie leads Planet and Environment Prizes at the X Prize Foundation, where he bridges the gap between science and society to, in, to incentivize solutions to diverse challenges facing our world. This work includes leading the $2 million Wendy Schmidt Ocean Health X Prize and the $20 million NRG Kosia Carbon X Prize. Dr. Bungie served as the founding executive director of the UCLA Center for Climate Change Sol Solutions and as the managing director of the Los Angeles Regional Collaborative for Climate Action and Sustainability. He is also the co-founder of Conservation X Labs, an organization that brings innovation to global conservation threats. Dr. Bungie is trained in biology with a Bachelor's of Science from the University of Southern California and a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he also serves on the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council for Oceans. In 2013, the American Association for the Advancement of Science selected Dr. Bungie as one of their top science and technology policy fellows who are dedicated to applying science to serve society. Before I bring this to stage, I'd like to let you guys know that we have over 2,000 people watching live online right now. As well, we have, we're trending on Twitter, so we're very excited to be here, and please, uh, let's have a warm welcome for Dr. Paul Bungie. Thank you, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, and, and thanks to uh, the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, Daniela, and everyone else for, for both having me here. I'm honored, uh, really, to be here. This is fantastic, and I'm, uh, I'm honored amongst the, the fantastic day I think that you've had. Some of my, my heroes in oceans you've all had a chance to hear from today, from Enrique and, and Greg this morning, and Julia, and, 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 and others. And uh, so I wanted to maybe, maybe finish this off with a, a bit of a cliche. And, uh, and I, I, I wanted to, to kick it off with something a little bit cheesy uh, and cliche because I hope to really quickly get to a point where uh, this seems like the kind of cliche we can all be proud to tell our friends and, and parents we believe in, that there really is hope for the ocean. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you the, the punchline before we get started because I want you to remember it. Um, and there's three principles that I want you to, to walk away from here today, and hopefully I'll, I'll clarify them as we walk through it. Number one, embrace exponentials. I'll tell you what that means in a second. Number two, pay for success. Successes are possible, and if you pay for them, people will be incentivized to accomplish it. And number three, empower the crowd. With that, though, it's probably obligatory for us to recognize that we're in a state uh, where our oceans aren't really doing that great, right? They're, they're unhealthy, they're unappreciated, and they're unknown. We really don't know a whole lot about them. Unhealthy, we could walk through the litany of, of issues from plastic pollution, as we just heard, to ocean acidification, warming seas, overfishing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Unappreciated, the vast majority of people, both in the United States and abroad, never give a thought to the ocean. More than that, they never do a thing that might economically benefit them. And typically, people act on what's in their economic best interest, not just out of the kindness of their hearts. And they're unknown. 
You've probably heard these statistics a lot, right? Somewhere between 5 and 10% of our oceans are properly mapped, for example. That's a lower percentage than the moon or Mars. And how can you know, or how can you protect what you don't know? How can you answer these kinds of questions? When are our oceans going to be free of waste if we just don't know? How are we going to feed 9 billion people by 2050 when fishing stocks are already crashing and likely to be unsustainable for even a few more years? What can we do about the disasters in the oceans? Can we predict tsunamis so that things like the, the Japanese quake that took out Fukushima or the Indonesian tsunami uh, don't kill thousands? Can we save coral reefs? I'm guessing that most of you in your minds are answering these questions in rather pessimistic terms. And uh, that's accurate. I, I, I think there's a lot of cause to be not just concerned, but put down, overweighted by the difficulties. But I believe, and we at XPRIZE believe, in something completely the opposite. And I'm going to tell you why I believe it, but I'm going to get to another punchline before I do that, that we believe the future can be healthy, valued, and understood. It is in our power to do so. Why do I think that? Let's go through some trends. That first thing that I mentioned I want you to remember about embracing exponentials. It's easy to be pessimistic when you rely on the typical way that we approach the world, which is a local and linear way. Remember, uh, we, we humans evolved in, in, on, on the, the plains of Africa in a, way, in a world where really what you need to know is where's the, the, uh, the, the food likely to come from. And it makes a lot of sense. You can picture in a linear world exactly how long it would take for you to walk to that tree in the distance. Right? Imagine this. You can all picture that. It's fairly easy. That's how our brains work. That's how our brains are wired in a linear sense. But we now live in a world that is exponential and global. We are completely connected globally. We are, our economies are intertwined across the planet. And all of this is accelerating in pace. That's the exponential piece of this. What do we mean by exponentials? I mean, a little, little bit of math, because I, I, uh, I am a scientist and I like math. And it also helps a little bit just to remind ourselves what we mean when we're talking about an exponential pattern, an exponential curve. Imagine taking 30 linear paces, right? And my steps are about a meter, meter long, a yard or so, right? And you walk, walk that, you can imagine you'll go about 30 meters, right? If I take 30 paces, I'm going to walk the length of a football field. We can all picture that, yeah? If I took 30 exponential paces, how far would I walk? By that, I mean every step I take is twice as long as the previous step. So one meter, two meter, now I can't jump that far, four meters. How far does that go? Any guesses? <laughs> Not quite infinity. But you would walk around the world 26 times. If any of you can actually conceive of that, 30, literally 30 exponential steps will take you that far. Don't feel ashamed if that's not intuitive. It's not meant to be. Our brains don't work this way. Thankfully, we do have things like math. And thankfully, we can measure what these sorts of things do. What does an exponential growth curve then do in the world? Well, it creates these sorts of incredibly powerful changes, especially in technology. Right? So think about the change and how much information we can store on a hard drive of some sort from the 1950s to today. In 1956, that is a 5 megabyte hard drive being lo loaded onto a 747. And it cost $120,000 for that 5 megabytes. By 2005, you could get 128 megabytes on a $100 flash drive, that little chip there. 11 years after that, you could increase that again a thousand fold density and get 128 gigabytes for half the cost. Those are doubling rates that have enabled us to capitalize on the incredible amount of data and information that the world sees. The more common one that you probably are familiar with is Moore's Law. This notion that about every two years, the performance, the power of a computer chip based on transistors doubles. And if every two years that about doubles, what you see is the exponential increase in our computing power. This graph shows if you, if you measure the amount of computing power you can get for a standard $1,000 laptop, that's on the, on the y-axis, what kind of computing power would that represent? Well, you can see this curve, right? and the exponential curves always, always kind of grow this way. 
starts to increase to the point at which we are today where the standard $1,000 laptop, so most of what you all have in the room or what you have at home, is about as good as a mouse brain. It has as, many, as, as, as much computing power as about a mouse brain does. Within just a few years, by the mid-2020s, that standard $1,000 laptop will be as powerful as a human brain. Jump ahead about 20, 25 years, and that standard $1,000 laptop will be as powerful as all of the human brains on the planet put together. That's hard to conceive of, but it's also opportunity. So this is one of those classic exponential technologies that we see in the world. What do I mean by exponential technologies? These are examples of technologies that accelerate and cheapen things we need to do. Sensors, artificial intelligence, robotics for things like self-driving cars, synthetic biology, CRISPR-Cas9, other devices that allow us to manipulate DNA at the molecular level. Virtual reality, how this is expanding extremely rapidly. Or 3D printing to democratize manufacturing, put it in the hands of anybody anywhere on the globe because it's just information, bits, zeros and ones that flow around the world and you make it there. And these technologies enable incredible things to happen. Think about just the simple one of, of basic internet web technology and what that's done to enable startup growth. In 2000, it cost about $5 million to start up your internet company. By 2005, it was, it was half a million dollars. Fast forward 2011, and it's only $5,000 on average to start a for-profit and profitable internet company. That puts the power of entrepreneurship in the hands of, of, of essentially billions more people that wouldn't have had access to that previously. That's the power of an exponential technology. Or think about the billions of people coming on, uh, online. In 2000, you had about 6% of the world that had access to the internet. By 2010, about a quarter of the world. By 2020, we are going to be at least two-thirds of the world's population connected to the global internet. And actually, if you ask some folks like, like Mark Zuckerberg or Larry Page and others, they think that we will be closer to 100% of the world by 2020 because of some of the efforts that internet.org uh, or Google Loon and such are trying to do. Regardless, what does that mean for us? Three billion new minds. Three billion new minds. New ideas, new solutions, new, 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 new friends. New folks that can do new things. Because not only are these people that are now connected, they are connected to all of you, all of us, and all of the world's information. That's the power of an exponential technology. Now, some technologies result in negative exponential curves. And I think it's important that we, that we recognize this. That black line, cumulative fossil, or, uh, greenhouse gas emissions put into the atmosphere. And yes, they have grown exponentially. And yes, the consequences, such as ocean acidification and warming, have also grown exponentially. Technologies don't think about what they do, the value of what they do, is it good or bad? That's up to us to put these things to use, to decide what to do. Paralleling these technologies, something even more exciting are the exponential tools that enable us to put them to good work if we so choose. Things like crowdfunding or crowdsourcing, getting those seven billion minds working on, on a problem you might have. Design thinking. How it is that we can root out a problem and identify solutions in iterative, rapid, and appropriate ways. Blockchain. People have heard of, of the blockchain in, for its use in, in Bitcoin, but it's ultimately, it's a trust machine. Big data. How we can analyze and understand patterns and information in big data and prizes. Oh, sorry, I did it again. And prizes. <laughs> this is, these are, this is the, the good stuff. I'll tell you a little bit more about prizes. Obviously, this is what XPRIZE does. But let me give you just a couple of examples of the power of these types of tools. Take this graph in, because this is, this is kind of crazy if you think about it. In 2010, there was about $880 million worldwide available in crowdfunding. By 2014, $16 billion worldwide. By 2015, $34.5 billion. That's in one year, over $18 billion more available in crowdfunding. Last year, Total crowdfunding available exceeded the amount of global venture capital available. You don't have to go to Silicon Valley and Kleiner Perkins and beg for your internet startup money anymore. You can literally go to the people that might care about it to fund it. And this is what awesome ocean groups like OpenROV have done, right? Kickstarter campaign. You can help address the, these, these ocean campaigns. But let me tell you a little bit more about prizes, because this is, as it turns out, not only a phenomenal example of an exponential tool, but one of the most powerful tools for solving grand challenges, be it in the ocean or anywhere else. 
How many of you knew that this gentleman flew across the Atlantic in order to win a prize? One. That's good. And probably some folks online. Charles Lindbergh and his Spirit of St. Louis airplane was attempting to win a $25,000 prize called the Ortigue Prize. It was put up by a hotelier in a, a French hotelier in New York City, which is why he said you have to fly between Paris and New York to win this $25,000. And there's some amazing things that came out of this. In particular, nobody thought this guy was going to win. They had the, the most famous aviators of, of the day, the, the barnstorming pilots that people knew of. Charles Lindbergh was a young man who'd been flying for three years as a mail carrier in Missouri uh, and was dubbed thus the flying fool because what the heck did he know about it, right? The confidence of some of his competitors uh, was such that he, one gentleman actually crashed on landing because he'd overloaded his plane with champagne and caviar in celebration of the day he was going to win, which I still can't figure out why he was doing that in New York to fly it to Paris, but so, so be it. He did some innovative things, too. He was the, the one to pioneer this brand new airplane built by a, a small air, airplane manufacturer in San Diego, California, with a single engine uh, uh, airplane instead of two engines. His argument being that if I have a mechanical failure of, over the Atlantic Ocean, one engine or two, <laughs> I'm toast. That's a risk, and I'll take it. Well, we all know the end of the story. He flew across the Atlantic, lands in Paris, becomes a global celebrity, and then it has impact that people may not have expected. Within 18 months of him doing this, he completely changed people's perspective on the dangers and opportunities of, of flying. Commercial air traffic in the United States increased in a year and a half 30-fold, 30 times. People getting airline licenses almost doubled in that year and a half. Aviation stocks soared. All of a sudden, markets are like, hey, there's a thing in this, right? So we all have this to thank, not just because it was cool that he do it and he became a celebrity, but because it inspired and catalyzed a market to pick up and grow. That's the power of a prize. That prize actually inspired our founder, Peter Diamandis, to found the X Prize, and this was the very first one. Some of you may, may, may remember in, in this in 2004, uh, Burt Rutan built, uh, and, then, uh, and then it was flown by a test pilot, Spaceship One, right here. It was subsequently licensed by Richard Branson and is Virgin Galactic, currently being tested as Spaceship Two. But there's some other amazing things that happened along the way. This was a pretty simple prize. X Prize put up $10 million for the first team that could privately fund and build a spaceship that could go into space, 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface, twice within two weeks. That's it. You had 26 teams from all over the world trying to do so, and a couple of really interesting things happened. Not only were the innovations different and, and interesting, people using balloons, people using rockets, this had a, has a, uh, a, a, essentially a, a modified airplane, uh, launcher one that, that, that this drops off from, but they all started pouring money into it. And for that $10 million prize purse that, remember, was only paid out when somebody accomplished the feat, we got over $100 million spent by all the teams trying to win it, a 10x leverage. And in fact, every prize we've done at XPRIZE, we've seen at least that 10x leverage. So not only are you not, not, not giving away money to somebody to, to develop something that you hope they'll be successful at, not only are you, are you paying them only once they're successful, you're paying only once out to the winning team while all of the others are simultaneously investing other funds and other dollars trying to win it. You're leveraging this opportunity, and it's, that's an exponential, right? 10x. That's an exponential. Other examples from other prizes that I think are just incredibly inspirational. The US Agency for International Development has a grand, had a grand challenge called Saving Lives at Birth. And this was one of the amazing things that came out of it. Jorge Odon is a car mechanic in Argentina. And he invented a device that could save breach and otherwise uh, at-risk babies in the course of childbirth, saving ultimately what, ha what has added up to tens of thousands of both infant and maternal lives to date. This is an example of an individual completely outside the health sphere. He's a mechanic who has an idea and can put that idea to use, crowdsourcing at its best. If you'd asked anybody in the World Health Organization or any of the experts in USAID or anywhere else, who should I pay to invent a new device that's going to save, save uh, uh, infants and moms as, 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 uh, through, through childbirth? I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have called up Jorge Odon, right? But that's the power of the crowd. That's the power of him having access to the internet to do these kinds of things. And then other things happen. This was, as you heard, one of the prizes that I ran at XPRIZE, the Wendy Schmidt Ocean Health XPRIZE, uh, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in, in a second. This is the second place team 
that was so inspired by this, the entire company got behind this, that they decided when they got their second, prize, uh, uh, second place prize check, $250,000, they were just going to give it away to the Argo Ocean Observing Program so that there could be even more science out in the world. Spent all this money trying to win and then gave away what they did win. Well, so if people are doing that, they're giving away the money, why are they competing? Why would you do this? And this is, again, the power of some of these exponential tools. Um, why don't you think for yourselves, e each individual of you, how many of uh, you here, or you folks walk watching, like to compete in anything? A dance competition, sports, uh, video games, massively multiplayer online video games, right? If, if there's somebody here that doesn't compete at something, I'm surprised, and, and I'd, I'd like to meet and find out how your brain works. <laughs> do any of these look familiar, then? Why you do it? If I'm putting up money, that's nice, right? No, no harm, no foul, right? I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, that the, the uh, uh, contestants in, in The Voice also like the, the recording contract and the money and such, right? But you're also competing potentially for resources. The winning team on the Wendy Schmidt Ocean Health X Prize, I'm going to cut to the chase on that because it's fun, comes from the great ocean state of Montana. And they don't have access to seawater but we provide the resources to test their new devices that won the prize, up to and including not only massive facilities and, and seawater tanks, but also taking them out to the deep sea in the middle of the Pacific where they can test in the real world ocean environment. We had a team on there from Great Britain that uh, we have this fantastic quote of them uh, on, on video where uh, un unfortunately we, we, we told them to put their devices down to 3,000 meters uh, beneath the Earth's surface, right? So crushing, or uh, beneath the ocean surface. Crushing, crushing pressure. And uh, at about 2,400 meters, their device failed and it crushed and, 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 and destroyed the battery compartment and stopped collecting data. And they have huge smiles on their faces at the end. They say, yeah, we made it down to about 2,400 meters. Before today, we got to about one meter. <laughs> so that's a win. Uh, they never had the opportunity to try it before. Those resources are incredible. If you're competing in The Voice, have you ever had the feedback of those kinds of mentors? That's what a competition can le lend you to. Or the coach on your, on your uh, soccer team, right? That's a resource. How about the fun of it? Most of this is just fun. It really is, right? They're games. That's kind of why I mentioned shows like The Voice or The Bachelor or Bachelorette or Survivor. These are, they're popular for a reason. Credibility and ego. Don't look this past or don't look past this. Uh, uh, Charles Lindbergh was, became famous. Doesn't hurt to become famous. It certainly doesn't hurt to feel good when somebody tells you kudos. You did remarkably well. Think about, think about what we just saw, the, 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 sort of, the sort of remarkable work that's happening here at Georgetown. Passion. Well, my guess is that most of you compete in things because you care about it. It makes you feel good. You're passionate about it. We get the same thing. And guess what? People want to solve problems. People care about the ocean deeply. And they passionately put their, put their efforts into it, even in Montana. And the competitive spirit, which is particularly true in, in, in the US, of course, where we kind of like to win everything, right? Winning. That's why I believe we will have a future that is healthy, valued, and understood. Because I know people are motivated by things that we can put to good use. I, it's not just me that knows this. XPRIZE knows this. This is our commitment. This is our vision of the future at XPRIZE. We believe this so much that a few years ago, we made a commitment to launch five XPRIZES in 10 years. We're a nonprofit. We have to raise that money. That's not easy to do. But we believe we can do it. We know we can do it. We believe we can put this world on a path to that because we've seen the power, the energy, the enthusiasm, the intelligence that this world has. We started with the Wendy Schmidt Oil Cleanup X Challenge. You remember the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. People, oil flowing out like crazy. Nobody knows what to do about this. How can we stop this, etc.? We asked the question, why is it that nobody can clean this stuff up? The technology had not changed in 30 years. We asked the industry, can you do better? No, we can't do better. We've been trying for 30 years, and we're the experts, and so it can't be done. They literally rolled out machinery that they'd used in Exxon Valdez cleanup 24 years earlier. It'd been mothballed until then for this. We can do better. And in within 14 months, we asked teams for a $1.4 million prize, anybody around the world who had, had over 30, 300 submissions, to at least double the rate of oil spill cleanup that we could get, that we, that we could do. Just, just double it. Seven of the 10 finalists at least did that. The winning team quadrupled the rate of oil cleanup and did it 
with well over 80% water to oil efficiency, which is a critical element of this, in 14 months. One of the finalist teams was, was led by a former professional athlete and a tattoo artist from Las Vegas, finalist team. Another finalist team was, a, was a, uh, led by a, a, a fisherman and his family in Alaska that modified fishing nets because they knew that if you could unload a fishing net off the back of your boat, then you could employ all of these fishing boats right at the point of attack when an oil spill happened. Now, just brilliant ideas that the experts in the room hadn't thought about. We moved on. Uh, Wendy Schmidt obviously graciously supported our next prize, the Ocean Health X Prize that I just mentioned. $2 million for breakthroughs in the measurement technology around ocean acidification. Right? The twin sort of, sort of evil of climate change, or ocean acidification. The, the oceans are absorbing, as probably many of you know, about a quarter of the CO2 that we put up in the atmosphere as a result of, of, of our fossil fuel emissions and the like. And that causes the pH to decrease, to acidify ultimately with potentially disastrous consequences for marine life. One of the, if, you, if you want a fun fact, it's not fun, actually it's a terrible fact, but it's a good way to remember this. The amount that the on average that the global oceans have changed in pH uh, is the same amount by which if your blood changed, you'd have a condition known as acidosis and be in the ICU on the verge of death. Our bodies are finely tuned, right? I mean, all of us, we ultimately come from the ocean, right? We were all, we all began our lives in an artificial ocean in our, in our mother's wombs, right? Mimicking the sort of chemistry of the, of the sea. We are similar, more similar than we probably realize to things like the clams and shellfish that are affected directly by ocean acidification. But these global measurements were, were fine, but they were only at the surface in only a few parts of the world. And so we had an average. How do you, how do you change the, the, what's happening in a particular coral reef that might be the livelihood of a tourism industry in the Caribbean? Or how do you change uh, the, 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 the acidity and the health of the ocean off the coast of, e of East Africa where uh, up to half of the protein that people are getting is from the sea? When you don't have the tools to measure it, you can't solve what you can't measure. And that was the genesis of this exact prize. Two million dollars, and like I said, we had comp competitors from around the world from high school teams and college teams to big companies to small companies like the one that won nine people in Missoula, Montana. And we saw breakthroughs that could really ultimately drive change in the world. Another one of my colleagues has taken that and now we are deploying, he's helping deploy with the US State Department's help sensors off the coast of East Africa, a place that has never had pH properly measured before. Now people that are reliant upon the sea have the opportunity to move forward. That's the power of some smart people, and a leverage model, an exponential tool like a prize that can change things. The third prize that we've launched in this series is the Shell Ocean Discovery X Prize. This is ongoing right now, so I encourage all of you to make sure you follow it. There's some calls to action here for you, right? You see all the websites up here. Go to xprize.org. Make sure you sign up. Make sure you, you, you follow this. This is a prize that addresses that healthy valued understood foundational issue. We can't have healthy oceans unless people value them in their hearts and their pocketbooks. You can't value something if you know nothing about it, if it's not understood. So at the heart of all of this, the fact that we have not explored our own planet properly, and we do not have the tools to do so, was why we launched the Ocean Discovery X Prize. We can't protect what we don't, don't know. And it starts with things like mapping and imagery. So this is a $7 million competition to produce, autonomously produce maps of the, uh, of the ocean's surface, uh, the ocean floor, at less than five meters resolution within 24 hours. If we do this using current technology, let me give you a sense of how, how, how much of a breakthrough this will be, right? Because we only have to pay when somebody accomplishes this. Using current technology, we could map the ocean's floor at that resolution in about 1,000 years. When somebody wins this prize, we will do it in 30, right? So that's the power of this. More than 50 times more, more rapid is going to happen. And not only are they going to be sending back these maps, they're also going to be sending back high resolution, high definition imagery. Because we want to engage people no matter where they are. And they have to do this, and here's one of the keys, right? You have to do this with a vehicle, something that you launch from shore. So we've got people with ideas that include drones that fly out into the ocean and then dive under the, under the ocean surface. We've got other ideas where they've got a drone boat that goes out and then it deploys a number of, of, of swarming bots, essentially, that all map kind of autonomously and in coordination 
right? We've got, we've got large scale autonomous underwater vehicles, these underwater drones that are doing things. We've got some folks that are working on ways of controlling them robotically and then tethering using a, a satellite link. Just tons and tons of ideas that are out there that have never been tried before. What happens when we get this? Well, number one, wonder. Did you know when we uh, were searching for the MH370, the Malaysian Airlines flight that, <clears throat> that crashed into the Indian Ocean, we found two active volcanoes on planet Earth, two active volcanoes we didn't know about. A canyon as deep as the Grand Canyon. Still haven't found the plane. But we find things under there that are unbelievable. Some scientists estimate that we only know about 10% of the species in the ocean. What else is down there? Now get this, in those 10% of species that are in the ocean, the uh, uh, National Cancer Institute did a study looking for compounds from natural, uh, natural sources, plants, animals, et cetera, that could potentially attack a tumor. And they, they found tumor active compounds from marine creatures 100 times more frequently than terrestrial creatures. And that's just a fraction of the diversity that we've seen before. So just imagine what becomes possible once we open up, the, the, once we democratize access to the sea. So that it's not just defense and oil and gas and a few researchers who are the ones that have access today. That's the kind of power of this. I, check it out, because they're going to be launching later this year. I can't tell you where, because we, we have to keep the map secret, secret, obviously. But you'll be able to follow these teams along um, beginning in the fall as they, as they, as they deploy and, and map out all of these things. So it's going to be really fun. Um, but that's only the third prize. So here's where I also want everybody to be engaged. We're going to launch two more by 2020. What should they be? Plastics, fishing, aquaculture, uh, predicting ocean weather, tsunamis. Help us out. Uh, we're not the smart ones. The smart ones are all of you, both collectively and the individuals that just happen to have an insight that is incredibly remarkable. Go on the website, join us in this. There's, there's ways of, 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 of uh, to xprize.org of, of influencing us, and we'll go through a process. We love all of these ideas. Just a couple of other examples, though, of how these challenges work. On the back of the Ocean Health X Prize, we launched the Big Ocean Button Challenge. Because we recognize that data isn't enough, we want to incentivize markets. We want people to make money off of that data for good. Because that scales, right? What if we could create an ocean services industry as big as the weather services industry? How many of you go to the National Weather Service and download spreadsheets of, of basic w weather data, what the wind speed is and all that, in order to find out if you need an umbrella? Yeah, you do? Awesome, okay. How many of you do what I do and open up you know, your weather app on your phone and, uh, and, and it tells you, take an umbrella, or you know, should I go skiing this weekend? And it tells you what the snow forecast is gonna be like. That's a service. Why can't we do that with oceans? Well, check it out. We've got 48 submissions right now that are developing these amazing apps. Go check this out. It's on a sister uh, company of XPRIZES called HeroX. Um, and 48 of these that are doing amazing things. We've got one, uh, uh, we've got a couple actually. We've got one where uh, using augmented reality, you hold up your phone and it images what's beneath the ocean surface. So imagine walking along the beach and, uh, and, and looking at, at the creatures that are underneath there. Right? Um, and another that does, uses the same thing, augmented reality, right? This is better than Pokemon Go in my, my, my world for uses of this, that, that will show you what sea level rise might do to your coastal environment, right? So they're building this app now. Another one that connects the fishers to their customers directly so that you can, you can, you can short circuit that time. So these are just certain ideas, right? A data that already exists, we want people to do this. Um, I'll also put in a plug for this. If you all love the idea of these competitions, you can create and fund, uh, crowdfund, and then run your own competition on Hero X. It's one of the reasons we built this, to, to crowdsource to the world. Uh, this is another one. Uh, you heard that I, I helped co-found an organization called Conservation X Labs, which helped run this on behalf of the Australian government, the Blue Economy Challenge, which was all about re-engineering aquaculture for sustainability. And this is crowdsourcing for all the best reasons. It needed to have a development focus in addition to a sustainable aquaculture focus. So we got solutions that, for example, improve how women can do kelp farming and profit off of it. Solutions that uh, use oral vaccines for aquaculture for fish, right? So, so uh, rather than dumping vaccines into the water, which actually escapes and can cause problems to natural habitats, using these oral vaccines that are engineered into the algae that they might be eating so that you can more, more directly target these and not, not, not result in some of these uh, other problems. And a whole suite of new ideas for products from everything from, from kelp to sea cucumbers and, and designs that will enable aquaculture to scale up in a sustainable way 
in some of these places that are incredibly poor and incredibly reliant on the sea for their food. Just amazing examples. Um, if you want another example of how to get involved, I mentioned Hero X, I mentioned going to XPRIZE and doing these sorts of things. Conservation X Labs this weekend is soft launching a digital maker space where if you've got an idea or you've got a skill set, you can go in and, and form a team and work together to build some sort of real solution. So that'll be up and then you have to talk to me about how to, how to, how to, how to join in there. But we love to have great and br brilliant people on this. Simple to build, right? We have the tools now to harness the power of the crowd. Therefore, if we've got the tools, I want you to answer these questions again. Now that you know how technology can help us, now that you know that these tools are out there, and candidly, I hope you believe me that it's as easy to use as it is, how would you answer the question of when our oceans will be free from waste? Very soon, I hope. Uh, how are we going to feed 9 billion people by 2050? Hopefully, we're using sustainable aquaculture as a central part of this solution, real sustainable aquaculture that protects wild fisheries and ensures we don't have to keep denuding the land for our protein growing. Can we predict tsunamis? Heck yeah. Let's do it. And in fact, let's go beyond there. I would love us to figure out ways to protect the lives of people that might be affected by these tsunamis. Because guess what? It's going to get worse with sea level rise, as are king tides and other sorts of storm events. Let's figure out ways to be resilient. And honestly, I don't have the answers, but that's the great thing. There's <laughs> more than 7 billion people on this planet. Somebody's got to. I'm confident of that. Can we save coral reefs? We can. We better. That's my conclusion. This is why we can do it. Embrace exponentials. We have the tools. We have the power to do so. Put them to good use. Pay for success. We don't have to pray for it anymore. People are willing to do something big, and we can pay for it on the back end. And empower the crowd, seriously. Experts are great. They know all the ways not to accomplish things, all the problems with doing it. But you give a kid or a car mechanic a couple of tools and an idea, and the world is their oyster. That's why I'm hopeful. I hope that's why you're hopeful. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thanks for, so much for listening to me. Let's go to it. Let's solve the world. Thank you thank so you. much again, Dr. Bungie. I want to thank all the speakers again today for being here, and thank you to everyone who's attended in person and online. We've learned so much about the threats facing our oceans, the intersection of ocean sustainability and climate change, and also the innovative solutions that are possible for addressing these urgent issues. We're equipping ourselves with a toolkit that each of us can go forward. Let's not lose this momentum. All of you have what it takes to be agents of change. Together, we can make the ocean famous. This concludes the third annual Sustainable Ocean Summit. Thank you.